right, everybody, welcome to NetDevOps Live. We are in season two, talk five, and a great session in store for us today with laptop tips and tricks for the NetDevOps engineer. Today's session will be presented by myself, and joining me on today's call is Simon Hart. Simon will be handling questions and answers in the Q&A panel throughout the entire session today, so be sure to take advantage of that as you go through if anything comes up. As always, if you're looking for the lap or the uh, webinar resources here for today's session, including the slides, code samples, and links to learning labs and other bits, you can find them in the webinar resources section up on NetDevOps Live, and Simon will drop a link for that. Now, before we get started with the content, as always, we are interested in gathering feedback and knowing who's interested in NetDevOps Live that's out there. So you can help me and the rest of the community out by heading over to cs.co slash NDL and logging into DevNet so that we can track all of the great interest and continue to bring you all of this content. Without further ado, let's jump right into today's session full of tips and tricks. And I've broken those tips and tricks down into four categories. First, don't be bashful, love thy terminal. And shh, SSH like a pro. We've all been SSHing for a long time, but there's always some new things we can learn to make it even better. Then we'll get into Oscar worthy bash scripts and some other bashy stuff. And yeah, I had a little bit of a sense of humor as I was putting my agenda together for today's presentation. And finally, make your apps dance. A couple of different tips related to specifically around using our applications. Now, before I jump into the tips themselves, a couple of things to keep in mind. Everything I'm going through here is not a gathering of the best tips and tricks across the interwebs done through a survey of hundreds of different folks. No, these are just things that I use every day to make my own uh, development and automation and net DevOps work better. So some of these tips may not be for you. They're just ones that I've got out there. Now, a few of the tips may seem really basic. Uh, and one thing I've learned in talking with other engineers is even something that seems basic to me could be new to somebody else. So even if you already know it, odds are good there's somebody else on the webinar today or watching the video where it is a breath of fresh air and something that's gonna help them out. And speaking of learning new things, I learn new things all the time. After today's webinar, I would love to hear all of your own tips and tricks, either in the WebEx team space for NetDevOps Live, on the social medias, email, anywhere. I'm constantly looking for new ways to make my own development work even better as it goes through. So don't be bashful, love thy terminal. Now bash is clearly not the only terminal or the only shell that we can use to interact with our computers and our devices, but it is pretty much everywhere and we need to become comfortable with it. If you're a Mac OS or Linux uh, user, if that's your operating system of choice, odds are good you're familiar with Bash because it's the default terminal. But you can also find Bash on network devices. On iOS XE and NXOS, both platforms offer what's called Guest Shell, which gives us a containerized instance of Linux, which you can jump into a Bash shell and run scripts, interface with your network device, all sorts of different things right at the edge. NXOS also provides access directly to the Bash shell for the underlying platform on which NXOS is running. That's right, you can actually get access directly to the platform in the Bash shell of NXOS as it goes in. Windows users, if you've been doing any network automation or net DevOps pieces, you've probably got at least one version of Bash on your Windows machine as well. Installing Git so that you can do source control and interface with GitHub gives you Git Bash, a great, Git, uh, a great Bash shell that I personally use quite often on my own Windows machine. And with Windows 10, Microsoft offers the Windows subsystem for Linux, which enables us to actually install several varieties of Bash distributions or um, Linux distributions as applications right on your Windows machine. And you can have access to Bash and all the great Linux utilities from there. So you will find Bash just about everywhere. Now today's session is gonna be full of demos kind of talking about some of these tips. So let's jump into the first one of those around some of these Bash bits that are out there. Let me find my cursor, there it is. So let's start out by looking at Bash actually inside of network devices. So I'm gonna SSH into one of our uh, Sam, uh, DevNet sandboxes that NXOS, Nexus 9000, always on, and go ahead and connect in and log into this device. Right, I'll give it my password. And so here we see I'm connected into the device, and if I do a show run, 
include feature, we'll see that we have feature bash shell has been turned on on this device. And so this is the ability to jump directly in again to the underlying Linux platform on the device. And I can do that with run bash. And so now we see the prompt is changed to bash 4.3. I'm connected to the Linux shell on that work on this switch that's there. And I can run Linux commands like ls l slash and look at the root file system for the actual switch. And if we're on the switch, and I know that because if I do ps-ax to look at the processes, ps is the process command, and we let this one run, what we'll actually see once it, uh, once it runs for us here, oops, there it goes. What we'll actually see here are all the processes that are running under the hood on our device that are out there. So we can see the Nexus processes that are going through. So in here we can see the different um, processes running for this workstation or the switch. So if I scroll up a little bit, we'll see I've got VLAN manager. That's the underlying NXOS process for VLAN management. Scroll up a little bit, we'll see some FIB and TIB processes that are running. So we do indeed have access directly to bash on the switch. Now you might be thinking, isn't that a bit risky? And it can be, but sometimes it can be very valuable to get access directly to that. However, if you want bash, but you're looking for a bit of a um, kind of a self-contained, maybe a secure zone for it, that's where guest shell can be really handy. So guest shell run bash. Now our prompt will change once more, but this time it's showing admin at guest shell. So again, I'm in a bash environment on my switch, but now it's a, a containerized version of Linux running as a container right at the edge. And so now if I do that same process command, ps-ax, we'll see that I don't see all the, under, the Linux processes or the NXOS processes, I just see the ones that are inside the container. Now in either one of these environments, I could run bash scripts or use Python to run Python scripts right at the edge. Um, lots of flexibility that's out there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of the actual bash shell and then out of the switch and get back to my workstation here. And there's one other thing I wanna talk a bit about bash and, and becoming comfortable with it. Now, when you're inside of a bash terminal, you're probably gonna to wanna to run scripts or programs that are there. So I'm gonna go ahead and show, we're gonna run one of our uh, bash scripts we're gonna look at a little bit later. And this is just a bash script that connects out to one, another one of the sandboxes and see that it's there. Now what I want to point out here is to run the script, what I had to do is actually provide a path, the actual full path to it. And so dot slash represents the local directory that I'm in. And so this script exists inside of my current directory. And I see that with doing a directory listing ls, we can see that I've got bash script um, one here in the local directory. And so in order to reference scripts in my local directory, we give it that dot slash and then bash script one dot sh. Again, that's how we can run a script. Now, in order to make a script executable so that you can execute it, you have to change the permissions for those. So if I do a directory listing here, what we can see are these little X's on the scripts. The X's indicate executable status, and you, do, you make a script executable with chmod plus X, and then you would give it the name of the script you wanna provide, and that would add that executable permission. And these are grouped into three groups. The first three here is for the owner of the file, and then folks that are in the group uh, ownership for the file, and then everybody else that's there so that you can actually hone in on who has access to the scripts that are there. So executable permissions. Now there's another way to execute programs that are out there. If you've seen me present before, you're probably familiar with viral utils. Viral utils is an, a, a command line utility, but it's actually a Python script under the hood that's there. And so to use that, I can just type viral. I don't have to give it the full path. And if you've ever wondered why, it comes down to the actual keyword path that's there. I have a command here in bash called which, and I can say which viral will tell me the exact location of the viral script or the program I'm using. And we can see that it's inside of a virtual environment in my environment or inside of my Python environment. So if I copy that out and I run it with the full path, it's the same command. It's the equivalent that goes through. The reason I don't have to provide the full path or even a relative path is because of the path environment variable, which I can print out here with echo and then dollar sign path. 
And what we'll see here is the path is the list of all of the folders, all of the directories and locations inside of my environment where Bash will go and look for programs to execute. And lo and behold, right here in my path is that folder that has the viral command that's there. And that's specifically out of the Python virtual environment I'm using. In fact, that's what a virtual environment does when you activate it, is it manipulates the path variable to tell the terminal where to find programs. So if I look for which Python, you'll see that it's in that same directory, users, HA presto, virtual ENVs, standard, bin. That's where executable programs inside of a virtual environment go. All right, I could do an entire session just on bash tips, but I wanna move on and we'll talk about some other stuff as well, but we're not leaving bash around uh, behind us just yet. I wanna talk about this source command that you may have seen in some of our learning labs or if you've done other things that are out there. And have you ever wondered exactly what source does in bash when you go through? So let's say we're given this bash script, env underscore demo one dot sh, that simply prints out some commands and then sets an environment variable called demo underscore var1 to a value of new env. Now we have two options that we can run or use this bash script. And first option, we give it that executable permission and then we run it. And then we could echo out seeing if we have access to demo var1. Option two is we could source that exact same file and see if we've got demo var1. And let's see what happens when we actually run through these live in our piece. Well, first I'll bring up that env demo. So here's that file and I will go ahead and we'll first try to run the file. So dot slash env one demo dot sh. And so now let's see if it actually worked for us. So if I echo dollar sign, oops, dollar sign demo var one, we'll see that I don't see the value that's there. Now, before we talk about why, let's do it the other way. I will source env demo1.sh. Now, if I echo that the demo var1, we'll see that I have my environment variable that's there. So clearly there's a difference between running a script and sourcing it. And what that difference is, is what bash, what the terminal is doing under the hood when we run those two pieces. When you run a script with dot slash env demo dot sh, what's going on is bash actually spawns a new shell instance, a new bash process, and inside there runs the script. And then once the script is over, everything that happens inside of that bash shell or that process is thrown away. On the other hand, when you source a script, where you uh, bash runs everything inside that file in the current terminal or the current shell that you're after. And so things like environment variables or directory changes that you make inside of that script are, are maintained going through. So it's a really subtle sometimes, depending on what you're after, but important difference. I will often use source and then an environment file when I'm trying to set environment variables for credentials or URLs for devices in the lab. Or if I'm setting up a workstation in, in advance of a hands-on lab, I'll use a source, uh, source some sort of a bash script because then I can do things like activate Python virtual environments, put myself or put the users into the proper directory, and then those things are maintained after the script finishes as it goes through. Now the next bit I wanna talk about still in the bash world here is this concept of aliases. Now aliases is something network engineers I think first ran into when we got to NXOS and we all used an alias to restore the right mem or some variation of right mem on our Nexus switches. We can see here in the screenshot, we try to write mem, it's an invalid command. We use CLI alias name WR, and then we turn that into copy run start. And lo and behold, I can just do WR again. And my keystroke, my muscle memory is still functioning for me. Now that works on next, uh, network devices, but it also works inside of bash and other shell terminals. It's a great way to create shortcuts for common, long, or complicated commands. If you've got that long git command that you use whenever you uh, mistakenly go into the wrong branch or uh, make a commitment before you want to and you want to kind of pull those back, those are common aliases to go through or file management. I use aliases with OpenConnect, the open source VPN client, to connect into my different labs and environments so that I can do those really, really easily as they go through. Now I've pulled together a handful of example bash aliases, some that I use and some that I found online. Things like LL for a very specific version of the directory listing. 
So rather than doing ls-l all the time, I simply do ll and I get a display that's in the list format, has colors, the sizes are done the way that I like it. And we'll see some examples of that in the next demo as it goes in. A couple of aliases to quickly find memory and CPU hogs. So figure out what's actually taking up everything on my workstation. Some networking ones. I can never remember the command to flush DNS with DS cache util on my Mac. So I created an alias for flush DNS that runs it for me. Great ways to go through. And this last one actually came from Simon, who's manning our question and answer panel today. If you stop a Docker container, it still kind of sits there on your workstation until you remove the Docker container. Well, that can take up a ton of extra space. There we go. So here's a dot, an alias for Docker underscore RM, which will remove all stopped and exited containers from my workstation as it goes through. Great example alias. Now the next bit of bash I want to talk about is the bash prompt itself. That's the little bit of stuff you see before you type in commands. Now that's actually controlled by an environment variable called PS1 or PS2 if you've got multi-line, but most of the time it's just PS1. And what the PS1 environment variable is a series of codes and functions that controls what your prompt is. For example, uh, slash w slash and then space dollar sign shows you your working directory and then a dollar sign. And there's lots of ways that you can customize it. I've got an example here of a web page where you can actually go through and tell it what you want in your bash prompt and it'll build um, content so that you can actually make it the way that you want to go through. Let's see a little bit of this in action. It's been a bit, a couple of minutes since we've done a demo out there. So in here, if we go ahead and we take a look at what the current value of my prompt or my PS1 variable is. So echo PS1, and we can see that it's, it's uh, got ST, um, STD for standard. That's my uh, environment or my virtual environment. And then dot slash W for working directory and then dollar sign. So again, we can see it. Here's the standard for the virtual environment. My working directory is dev tips and then a slash space and the dollar sign. So that's my prompt. Now I can change that simply by exporting out and changing the value of PS1. So here, if I export a new PS1 and say, okay, I want to add in slash H for my host name, the workstation's host name, I already hit enter on that one. And we can see now my prompt has been added to have the host name injected into the prompt as it goes through. Now there's all of these codes you can do to manipulate what you want. I'm gonna go ahead and reset it back to my default by sourcing out bash profile. We're gonna talk about bash profile in just a minute. And then there's one other bit that you can actually do. Um, I will occasionally, I, I used to see a lot of people doing this and then did it myself, where I can actually add in information about my Git repository for the working directory that's there. So I've gone ahead and I've updated um, the function that manages my bash profile or my uh, Git, my prompt for bash. I'm gonna resource it and set it. And now what you'll see is my prompt is changed and it's injected real-time information about the status of my terminal. We can see the branch inside of my repository that I'm currently there, and I can see changes. I've had files that have been changed, and I've got things that I could commit in as they go in. The green check mark tells me whatever command I last ran worked fine, there was no problems with it. If there was an issue, it'd be an X with different errors and exit codes. So there's lots of flexibility you can do with your bash prompt to make it kind of yours, customize it for the way that you're after. And it's simply, again, this environment variable PS1. Now you saw me do that source bash profile. So we already talked about what source does is it updates your current shell instance with a, whatever is contained inside of that script. And bash profile is simply like a bash script where you can add things like um, your prompt updates, aliases that are common, terminal settings, just about anything you want to customize your bash environment, you can put into that bash profile or this file, a uh, similar file, bash RC on Linux. Now there's some underlying differences in kind of how the files go through more than I want to dive into depth today. Fundamentally, um, the, the key things to keep in mind is that if you're on a, a Mac OS, the file you want to look for is dot bash profile. The dot indicates it's a hidden file, but it's located in your home directory. Or dot bash RC if you're on a Linux distribution. Um, you want to put those types of changes in those different areas. And it's a way that you can go ahead and customize it. 
If you Google around for a little bit, you'll find examples where folks have posted their bash profiles or their bash RC files with suggestions around aliases and setup. Um, here's one that I found a long time ago and started to pull in some suggestions from him and learn some new aliases and tips and tricks that were out there. So getting your bash environment just the way you want it is a great way to customize your laptop environment. All right. We'll leave Bash behind for just a little bit and we're gonna talk a bit about SSH in this section. Now I know what you're thinking, Hank, we've been SSHing for years, we're network engineers, that's how we do our job. And we'll pretend that we don't tell that anymore at all. But I still think there's some stuff that we can look at to make SSH a bit better for us. We're gonna start out with authentication, yep. We wanna become power users inside of authentication and that means certificates. Passwords are so 1980s. No sysadmin out there anymore is using passwords at all. They're simply using certificates. And it's something that I think every network engineer kind of knows we can or maybe we should and they're more secure, but it's not something we dove really deep into. But frankly, it's not that hard to do it. In fact, let's actually take a look at it live inside of our demo and see how to use SSH-based authentication really quick and easy. So I'm over here back in my environment and I'm gonna go ahead and create an SSH uh, public-private key pair with the SSH keygen command that's inside of my bash environment that's here. Now by default, SSH keygen creates uh, a key called id-rsa inside of a, a folder. We're gonna look at that in a minute, but I'm gonna create a very specific one for the demo here because I'm gonna show the keys off and I certainly don't wanna show those keys on a recorded webinar here that's gonna be out there. So I'm gonna create a new key called demo ID RSA with SSH keygen. It asks for a passphrase. Now I'm not gonna provide one for a couple of reasons. The reason, one of the reasons we use certificates is that we want to go ahead and not have to provide passwords inside of our scripts and all these other areas. If you put a passphrase on, a, on a, a key, every time you go to use it, you have to provide the passphrase, which kind of negates the convenience factor. So it is less secure not to have a passphrase, but Frankly, most certificates, SSH certificate or keys that are out there are done without a passphrase. But that does mean you have to be very careful about what those keys are and where you share them and you have to keep them safe. And so if I look, actually I'll use the LL alias that we saw, we can see that when I ran the SSH keygen, it created, oops, created two new files for us, demo ID RSA and demo ID RSA dot pub. The dot pub is the public key. And notice the permissions difference. SSH keygen automatically says only the owner of the file can read and write the private key. Nobody else has any permissions at all. The public key, everybody's got read access to it as it goes through. We can look at the contents of these using the cat command. So if I cat demo ID RSA, we'll do pub first. We'll see this is the public key kind of file that was created. Here in the middle is the actual key. So I've highlighted where the key, the public key part is. The beginning of this is just some information about what type of key, SSH RSA, and then at the end, kind of where it came from. It came from me on my workstation. But the public key itself is just that bit that's in the middle. Now the private key looks a bit different. It comes through, and you may have seen keys like this before if you've done TLS for web pages that are out there, they kind of look similar. But we can see our uh, this line at the start and the one at the bottom are kind of comments. And then the actual private key is here. Now, before everybody goes and writes down this private key, I'm going to go ahead and delete this one right after the demo. So it's not going to serve you any good purpose. Now that I have the key, let's go ahead and put it to use by copying it up to a Linux server that I want to go ahead and log into. Now there's SSH copy ID is a really convenient bash command that does all of the heavy lifting for me. I tell it what key do I want to go. It's going to be the demo ID RSA dot pub key. Again, the public key is what we're copying up. And then I give it the developer at 10.10.2020. So that's one of our dev boxes in a sandbox I'm connected to. This is going to go ahead and copy this key up into that um, server for me so I can use it. So I do have to give it the password to go ahead and kind of authenticate to make the copy function. And it says, okay, it's copied it up. We can see number of keys added was one right here on this line. And then it says, go ahead and test it with SSH. So now I'm gonna SSH, whoops, ooh, my keyboard is getting a bit nuts. Uh-oh. <laughs> SSH, 
Ooh. Okay, that's fun. Let me uh, power off and power back on my keyboard a little bit. Live demos are great, though I've never had my keyboard kind of go quite this flaky before, and that's a tough one. All right, connect it again. All right, things are looking good. So SSH-I for the key file. Now there are default kind of key files that are there, but again, I specified one for the demo. So I'm gonna go ahead and just give the uh, the name of the key, the private key. And this time it is the private key because that's what I need to use to authenticate. And then developer at 10, 10, 20, 20. So I go ahead and try to log in. And lo and behold, I was able to log in without providing the password that was there. And I'm connected now to this dev box that's there. Um, as it goes in. So now when I, so what did SSH copy ID do? So here on the dev box in the home directory is this folder called, we uh, called dot SSH, um, one second, dot SSH. And inside that folder, ls l dot SSH, there's this file called authorized keys. This is where the public keys have to go. And copy ID simply logs that cop SSH copy ID command logs into this server and then copies the contents of the public key into it. And if I look at that file, authorized keys, we'll see that there is the key, right? SSH RSA. And if we had kind of captured it, we would see that that's the same public key. And it's even got the stamp for where it came from. It came from me on my workstation as it went in. And so this is how we use it with Linux servers. And the SSH copy ID command makes it really simple to get those keys put where we want them. But we're network engineers, Hank. How do we do this inside of kind of uh, network switches and things? Well, it's really not all that complicated. It's the same basic idea. We have to provide the public key to the devices. And so we're gonna do that and we'll kind of demonstrate how to do that on an iOS device. Now, the first bit we have to see is um, we have to format the public key so that we can use it and kind of inject it into the configuration in iOS. And we have to, the reason we have to do that is because iOS only has uh, so many line character lines in the configuration it can go through. And the public key that we see here, well, that is um, one kind of really, really long line, too long for a single configuration. But bash gives me a nice command called fold, which will kind of wrap um, a, a file out into a certain number of characters. So I'm going to say wrap that key into 48 characters wide. I know that'll fit in config and it'll look decent. And I'll say idrsa.pub. And so this then takes the public key and formats it to 48 key uh, characters wide. Now remember what I said, the key is this bit that's in the middle. So that's the part that I'm gonna need for my configuration. So I'm gonna highlight that and then have that ready for me as it goes in. Now I'm gonna log into one of my iOS sandboxes. So SSH, now it runs on port 8181, root at ios-xemgmt.cisco.com. And once it prompts me, now again, we don't have, we haven't put the key in yet, so I gotta put my password in there. Once it comes back and lets me log in. <clears throat> Live demos, we'll try this again. Come on. Give it one more go and then we'll go off to the Nexus device. Oh, there it goes, okay. So let me get the password over here. Get a little nervous when the uh, internet's run slower than expected. Or my sandbox is running a bit slower than expected. All right, here we go, it's almost there. So I'm on my iOS device, and so what I wanna do is configure my public key that's there. Though it is running a touch slow for me here. Actually more than a touch slow. All right. Oh, or maybe it's just my keyboard has died off on me again. No, it's not that. All right, let's see if I can get it to work. All right, we're back in business. All right, so in config mode, I'm gonna go ahead and do IP SSH and then pub key chain, right? We're adding a public key. And now that what user am I gonna add this public key for? So username will be root. Now root's not a common username on network devices. It is in the Linux world, but uh, it's what we happen to use on this device. So username root and then key string. 
and this is where I put the key in that we had from before, the kind of the formatted one. So I'm going to scroll up here and copy the key part, again, just the key, and then paste it in to my configuration. So we'll let this kind of paste the entire key in, and we'll see that it's doing kind of uh, 48 characters per line as it goes in, it puts it into the configuration for me. One more line here. <clears throat> <Come on. clears throat> I wondered how many other people are currently using this same sandbox that I'm using. All right, come on. Come on, we're almost there. How long was this key? Right. <laughs> Normally it's not this long, but again, this is one of our public always on sandboxes. So maybe it's got a lot of folks using it today right now, or my internet could just be running a bit slower than normal. One or the other. Oh, whew. okay, key's done. So now we'll exit out of config mode. Uh, and actually exit clear out of this device. Now again, what was the configuration? Uh, IPS, SSH, pub key, all of those bits that go in there um, and get me through. One more. All right, okay. So now I've put the key into the configuration. Let's see if I can SSH using it. So skill the SSH command, dash I, uh, demo ID RSA. So that's the private key that we're gonna use and then try to log in. And then this should go ahead and let us log in without having to provide the password this time. Uh, but again, it's a bit slow of a sandbox today, so we'll just give it a second to let it off. Ah, there it goes. Whew. That was quicker than before. So we'll notice my SSH command here, dash I, give it the private key, um, that, and I didn't have to provide the password. Really convenient to go through. Uh, NXOS is, is actually a bit easier because we don't have to fold the key to put it into the configuration on iOS or on NXOS. Now I created the key file again called demo ID RSA because I wanted it for the demo and we're gonna show it. But the default place where KeyGen puts keys is in the home directory. Um, so tilde represents our home directory and then a folder called .ssh. And we'll see here in my .ssh directory, this ID RSA is my personal private key that I use for login. And then ID RSA.pub is the public key that goes. Now, if you um, are going to be using SSH and certificates a lot, my suggestion is just use those because then you don't have to use the dash I flag every time you go ahead and provide those login information that goes through. Now, coming out of the SSH uh, demonstration, inside of the slides when you grab them, I've put some notes, some of those key commands and pieces to know. So these are for you inside of the slides. So to create a key pair, SSH key gen, copy it to a server, SSH copy ID, and then the configuration blocks for both iOS and NXOS on how to put the keys in. So it's really, really quite simple. Um, not a lot of good excuses anymore for us to, uh, to avoid using certificates um, inside of our, our authentication pieces. And the value is now we don't have to keep our passwords kind of buried inside of scripts and environment variables as they go through. Now, the next piece I want to talk about with SSH is how we can customize our experience of SSH, but with the configuration file for SSH. Now, at, uh, in our home directory, again, tilde.ssh, there's a config file, or if it doesn't exist, you can create it called just config. And here's where we can actually customize the SSH client inside of Bash that we're using. And some of the ways you can do this is by creating aliases for host. Now we saw when I was SSHing into that sandbox, it's a long command, SSH-I for the, um, what we want to use for the, uh, the identity file, if we have to provide the private key, the port that it's connected to as it goes in, uh, what username that's there. Well, all of those things can be connected underneath a host alias. And so I can just SSH SBX-IOSXE and I don't have to remember the full IP or name, uh, username and port changes that are there, even the identity file. So it's a great way to kind of have commonly connected devices and their settings. 
Another great use of the config file is for maybe older devices that don't use the, the newer, more secure uh, ciphers and algorithms that have kind of come out in the last couple of years. I have some old switches in my environment that don't have an iOS code that support those newer encryption ciphers and algorithms. So I can go into my config file and say, okay, for this old switch where here's the IP address for it, what's the cipher and algorithm that I want to use to connect to it? Or what do I want to allow that device to negotiate to? Because those are some ciphers and algorithms that aren't typically allowed by default. Another great use of the config file for SSH. And the other one that I use all the time are those pesky lab certs that change on my devices. So if you've got a range uh, like in your lab, uh, an IP range that goes through and we know, hey, these devices get reloaded all the time, or maybe it's the range of IPs from DevNet Sandbox. And every time you reserve an instance of the Sandbox, those keys are going to be different because they're different instances, but same IP address. And so when you try to SSH to them, you get that warning, that problem, hey, you can't connect to this device, the key changed. Well, there's an easy way to solve that inside of the config file. You can go through and use wildcards to indicate kind of ranges and say here, anything that's in the 172.20 and then any third and fourth octet, I want to disable host key checking. And then I want to say, take the, the key that comes in and rather than save that key, just put it in dev null, which is the equivalent of throwing it away. Don't remember it. Now these are security changes. So you got to keep in mind what you're telling it is don't bother checking the host key and don't even keep it around. Now, if these are lab ranges, that can be really convenient. But don't do this blanket across the entire IP space because that would be really insecure to go through. But for those lab environments, a very handy type of a feature to go in and take advantage of as they go through. All right, enough on the SSH for a little bit. I want to jump in and talk a bit more about Bash and specifically Bash scripts and how we can start to use those as part of our network automation and different types of pieces that are there. Now we're going to start out with actually curl before we jump into the bash scripts themselves because I'm going to use curl as one example. It's actually a really common example of what I put into my own bash scripts when I'm setting them up for automation workshops or labs and things like that. Now curl is just a, a Linux CLI based HTTP or a web client that goes through and you which means you can run it from your bash terminal. It's a great way to check and see if a service is up before moving on. Before you can configure a device using its REST API, the REST API has to be active. And so you can use curl inside of a bash script to check that. Or maybe you need to pull some information out of one API call and use it for another one. Curl's a great way to do that as well. So I've got an example here, but I've actually got a bunch of them that we're gonna run live here inside of our bit, uh, inside of our terminal. So I'm gonna go ahead and let me pull up the curl examples file, and we'll talk through these and run them. And so our first example here is a, a fairly basic, it's actually um, a common, but, but um, it's, a, it's a very basic curl exercise that we can go ahead and use, but it pulls up some of the, the, the flags that we need to be aware of. And so here curl, and then dash K is instructing curl to say, you know what, if this is a, a secure site, HTTPS, and you get a self-signed certificate or one that doesn't verify okay, we're all right with that. It's the equivalent of hitting that accept button in Chrome when you navigate to the to a web management page for a device that has that self-signed certificate. So dash K, allow unsigned certificates. Dash U is how we can provide the username and password for basic authentication. Now curl takes away, uh, will automatically take that string root colon and then the password, uh, username colon password, and then run the base64 encoding and then create the authorization header that's needed but makes it really easy so we don't have to do that ourselves. We can just do dash U. Dash H is how we can add additional headers. In this case, we're saying, go ahead and send me back Yang data in JSON format. And then finally, the actual URL we're gonna hit. Now this four, these four lines is one bash command. At the end of each line is this slash and no space after those slashes, just the slash those are bash line continuation characters so that I can format the command across multiple lines for human readability. So if I paste that in here, we'll see that I do indeed get my JSON body back as it goes through, returns it come, as it comes back at me. Now this is a great way again to get a block of data, but if I'm doing this in a script, maybe I want, I'm looking for some other information. 
maybe I'm exploring how an API call works. And so I want to actually, uh, I don't care about the data. I care about the headers. I care about the negotiation process. That's where the dash V flag can come in for, verb for verbose output. Curl will then show us kind of everything under the hood that's going on. And if I really don't care about the actual content, in this case, the JSON body, I can use dash O for where to output the data to and go back again and we'll output it to dev null. Again, just throw that data away. I don't care about it. My username and password and all the pieces. So if I run this one, we'll run this command and we'll see down here at the bottom as it finishes, I didn't get any data. There's really, we don't see the JSON body because it's all been thrown away. What I'm interested with this example is everything up here at the top. I'm gonna to scroll back and find the top of it right here. So here's where the output starts. We can see all the negotiation at the TCP layer. We can see the security for the TLS authentication that goes through. Scroll down a little bit, I'll actually see all the certificate information from the device. Again, it's a self-signed cert. And then what I often want, am interested in are the headers that I both sent as part of the request as well as got back as part of the response. These greater than symbols indicate the request. And so this is the content of the request. It was a Git request. What was the path that went to what host the authorization? So this is where curl converted my username password into this header and then the other bits. The response is all contained here with these less than symbols. So I got a 200. Okay. You can see the server. It's an iOS device. It's a CSR, but under the hood, it's actually running engine X as the web server and the other bits and pieces that are there. A great way to kind of look under the hood at what our APIs are doing. Now I can build on that example. Let's say all I really cared about was what the status code was. Was this API call successful? <clears throat> well, I can update my curl command with a couple new flags. S-S -S is silent mode, which actually uh, quiets down even more, gets rid of some of the, the noise that comes through. And then dash W is a way to format the output that we get through. And there's a whole set of codes you can use in that formatting. Check out the full curl documentation by using man curl to look at the manual. But here, percent HTTP code will just pull out the HTTP status code as it goes in. And so now if I run this command, what we'll see is the output is simply, it's actually hidden here in front of the prompt, 200. It just tells me the status code. So now we're starting to see where this can become valuable. So I can actually grab that status code and use that maybe in a conditional. I only want my bash script to continue if the status was 200, right? That the API is okay. And then our final example kind of raises it up even farther. Now I'm back to pulling the data out, but I don't care about the entire raw JSON body. I actually want to process that JSON body and pull out maybe one piece of information. In this example, the IP address. And so what I'm doing is taking my curl command, uh, which goes out here and it's requesting, if I scroll over, we can see it's requesting details about a very specific interface. And then I'm piping this upper, this lower, uh, straight up and down characters called the pipe. I'm gonna pipe the output from that command, which will be the JSON body to Python. And specifically, I'm gonna give it at dash C says, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna give it the, the command inside of Python I wanna run. And so I'm gonna say import sys so that I can get access to the standard in the output from curl. I'm also gonna import JSON library so that I can process the JSON data. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna just simply say, I wanna print out a bit of data. I wanna json.load the standard in. Again, that'll be the output from curl. And then I wanna go into that and actually go through the dictionary into the interfaces, into the interface, into the IPv4 information, into the address, specifically the first address, and then output the IP address. So now with this uh, fair, I'll, I'll call it simple, but it's fairly straightforward curl command. I can run that. And now when I run this against my device, what I get back is the IP address. Again, this can be really handy inside of our bash scripts if we wanna pull out specific bits of information that are there. So if I come back to our slides for a real brief, now in the slides here, I've kind of got some details about three different examples that are there. This first one is how to create a variable based on output. Our second one, we kind of extend on that with a loop to wait. And then in the final script, we kind of pull it all together by asking the user for input. Rather than look at the slides, let's actually look at this script, kind of the code itself as it goes in. 
And so if I come over here and we're going to just go to the bash script three. So this is the one we're going to run. I can see I'm just echoing out some details about what's going through. We can see inside of bash, I can actually create a function. So I want to have that curl command to get the status code and I might have to run it a few times. Last week on NetDevOps Live, Brian Byrne talked about the dry principle and using functions and not repeating ourselves. And so we can see I'm creating a bash function called get status code, which will retrieve the code and then print it back out. And echoing like this is how we would return a value from a bash function. I then use that function to get the status code. And I'm gonna then run this while loop that says, okay, until the status code comes back as 200. So this is while it's not equal, dash NE for not equal to 200, and the counter is less than 10, because I don't want this loop to run forever. I wanna go ahead and just wait for 30 seconds with sleep, and then check the status code once more using the function, and then uh, again, then it loops over. Once it's done, it comes through here and says, okay, well, go make sure the status code was actually 200, in, rather than just timing out. As long as it was, then we can continue on. And then we get down to the bottom here in our script where I can ask the user using the bash read command to prompt the user dash P with a prompt that says, what interface would you like to check? Um, for example, gigabit ethernet one, and then whatever the user provides us, we're gonna store that as a variable called interface name. I can then use that inside of another um, curl command to retrieve the interface, the IP address for that very specific interface. So here we're seeing how we're pulling together some of those curl examples into a bash script as it goes in. So let's go ahead and test this bash script as well. So this is bash script example three, and we'll see how it goes. So this first bit here, right, it checked to make sure that it was up. So this is where it actually went ahead and checked for the status code of 200. Now it was 200 because we know it's up, so we didn't see it waiting but it verifies that, yep, it's up and running a 200. Now that it's know it's up, we've got some information, let's get an IP address. Now all of these string outputs are from that echo command. It's now asking me with a prompt, what interface do I wanna check? We'll go ahead and we'll just check gigabit ethernet one. I press enter to continue the bash script. It makes the curl request off to the device to get the IP address and then print it out that's there. So here we've seen how we can actually pull together some of those bash information, the, uh, the curl utility, all these other pieces. Now you may be wondering, Hank, we talk a lot about Python. I could do all this in less code with requests and it would actually make a bit more sense, read a little bit better. And that's absolutely true. I'm not saying we should replace Python scripts with bash, but you may find yourself um, in an environment where you don't have access to Python or maybe the version of Python that you want or the ability to load things like requests and these other ones, but you have a bash terminal and you've got access to these common Linux utilities. So becoming comfortable with writing bash scripts, understanding them is important as you kind of continue on your network automation journey as it goes through. All right, we are coming down to the end here. So let's go through, oh yeah, one final bonus bash example. Now another process I use in my bash scripts a lot is to process kind of the, all of the files in a directory. And so in this example, I'm using NCS load to load in configurations to Cisco NSO. And I don't know what those configuration files may be. I don't know what their names are, or how many there are. What I wanna do here is say, okay, for every file, so for F file in this directory, device underscore configs uh, slash all, so all the files, I want to do a loop and I want to NCS load. So this is the, pro, the, the NCS command I'm gonna run for user admin, dash M for merge in, and then I'm gonna load whatever the file is that came out of the loop. This is a really simple bash script that makes it very easy to process, again, all the files in a directory if you don't know what's going on. So this simple for loop's another great bonus bash tip as I wanted to throw it out there. And the last one we're gonna go through here, and probably our last demo looking at the clock here, is make files. Now make files kind of build on the concept of bash scripts, but giving us kind of a way to kind of count, um, combine together workflows that we need to go through. And so I often will go ahead and do build up uh, routines for make dev if I wanna set up an entire dev environment and have lots of things that I need to do, or make clean, how to tear them down. 
Now you may have run across make before if you've ever done any kind of uh, compile software from source on a Linux workstation and make install may be something you've seen before, make alt install. But the concept of the make file is something that you can use just about anywhere. So I'm actually gonna clear my screen and I've got it set up here with make dev. And I'm gonna start the script and then we'll, we'll actually look at the file and what it's doing. And so over here, I'll bring up the full make file. And so I ran make dev make dev is the keyword that we're interested in and then it runs each of these individual bits that are there so it's a way to kind of combine together different workflows and so the first thing it did was make viral if i look at vi make viral we can see that it echoes out starting the viral topology and indeed it did starting the viral topology and then it runs the viral up command against the viral files to ios router so it's going to bring up a viral environment and then it's going to sit there and wait for about 90 seconds to make sure it's in good shape then the dev will move on to make NSO. For make NSO, it will go ahead and do NCS setup, double underscore or double dash package, Cisco IOS, and then the destination directory uh, local that's here. <clears throat> All right, so make NSO. So after the viral will finish here in a second, then it'll create the NSO, and then it's going to run the viral generate block. Viral generate runs two viral commands. First generates the NSO inventory, so loads up our viral topology into NSO, and then also creates the PyATS uh, testbed file so that we can go ahead and actually use PyATS and Genie against this lab that goes through. Once that's done, oh, and we can see here now it's moved down to the setting up the NSO, so we're moving right along. It'll then do the NSO sync from. Down here, what is NSO sync from? It runs actually a curl command against NSO on the development instance right on my laptop to instruct NSO to pull in the initial starting configuration from my network that's out there so that we can read it. And then lastly, it runs Genie Learn, which will go through and learn all about the interfaces from the devices that are there. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, by simply typing make dev, this is gonna go ahead and start up a viral network for me. Then it will create an, a development instance of Cisco NSO that I can use to kind of do my automation. It will uh, bring in the viral environment into the NSO instance or the NSO um, uh, instance on my laptop. It'll synchronize them correctly. It'll create a testbed file for PyATS and Genie. And then down here, you can see this just about done. It will go ahead and learn all about the interfaces on the devices as it goes through, simply with make dev. Now, all the commands that it's running, I know those commands, but if I needed to type them all one at a time, waiting for the ones before to finish and make sure they go through, it would take me much longer than just letting kind of the make dev workflow work for me. And so even, um, I'll use this when it's a project that's just for me, but it becomes even more valuable when I'm working on a project with other people because I can include that make file. Again, that's all it is. It's just a file called make file in my directory and it will go ahead and give me the ability so anybody can clone this repository down, even you, request this sandbox. Again, it's just the multi iOS sandbox. Run the make dev, and it'll set up this environment for us. We can see down here it's finished. Genie went ahead and learned the information about the routers. All the bits are there. And just to show that it's working, I can uh, log into NCS or NSO, and we can do show running config devices device router one uh, config and we can see indeed nso has been loaded up with my network off of viral and it's functioning so there's the configuration that's there and then the last one here viral nodes will show me that indeed i do have my network that's up and functioning it's all there and then when i'm done i want to close this down clean it all up i don't have to remember how to uh, turn off all of those things or all the files that were created I simply run make clean, and this will undo everything that it did. It starts by turning off NSO, it'll then uh, shut down the viral simulation, and then delete all the files that were set up there as well as part of those bits and pieces. All right, five minutes to go, plenty of time for me to finish. Our last uh, section of tips here around applications and enhancing our applications. First, I want to talk a bit about our application package managers. If you've used Linux distributions like Red Hat or CentOS or Ubuntu, maybe you've run across Yum and Apt before. Most of us have probably stumbled into those. But did you know both Windows and Mac have package management tools as well? 
homebrew for Mac, and chocolatey on Windows. Now, both of these are kind of community built. These are applications you can install and use. They're not native to kind of Microsoft or Apple. The window or Microsoft does seem to be bringing some of these features directly in, but they are very, very handy for working with your applications. In fact, when I set up my last computer on both Windows and Mac, I didn't uh, manually download and install any applications. I simply use these tools that are there. And so I'll have one quick demo on this one because I think it really kind of helps to see it. On my Mac, if I run brew list, we'll see all of the different applications that I've installed with Homebrew. Things like OpenConnect, the open source VPN, Python, this in this case Python 3 as well as Python 2, installed with Homebrew. And then brew also has a, a concept called cask, um, or if I do brew cask list, now, when you use Homebrew to install, these are typically open source uh, projects or command line utilities, um, things that are going to be installed kind of uh, in that type of a fashion. Now, thicker applications, things like Postman or Wireshark or Google Chrome or Atom, those are stored as called casks, where we actually download kind of the full on application file and install them appropriately. So we can see here on my uh, workstation, I could script or uh, the setup of all of my common applications and don't have to manually download them at all. Under the hood, what Brew is doing is all of those steps you would manually do, they're just done as part of the packaging. Now, if you can go up and you can take a look at the web pages for these. So if I go and find the Homebrew one that's over here, we can see Homebrew here and you can scroll down at the bottom and take a look at all of the different packages that are available. And then Chocolatey does the same thing for Windows, where you can have this type of an ability that goes in. And so again, if you're trying to figure out how to better manage your applications, these package managers, quick tip I wanted to throw in that was out there. Now a similar quick tip is kind of building on uh, the IDEs, the code editors, the development tools that we use, and the ability to extend out those IDEs with plugins. So whether you're using VS Code or Atom like I do, or Sublime, or any of the other ones, Nearly all of these tools have this ability to have extensions installed to add additional features, like language support. There's actually an Atom plugin for Cisco config files, which will color uh, code this, the syntax inside of iOS configs. Pretty handy. There's tools for integrating with cloud services or doing um, data manipulation and management. Now, all of these tools have got marketplaces where you can browse the different plugins that are out there see the community feedback, how popular they are. Now, a bit of, uh, I don't wanna say too much of a word of warning, but do keep in mind two factors when you add plugins or extensions into your, uh, your IDEs. Many of these are community created. So make sure you kind of trust where it's coming from um, as it goes through. You don't wanna accidentally inject some malware onto your workstation with some sort of a plugin that's out there. And as you load, load plugins in, you may find yourself into a, a bit of a performance um, impact that's out there if you put too many that are there. Now, all those said, they will make your development experience much better if you take advantage of them. All right, for our final tip, I wanna talk a bit about developer mode and web browsers. Now, what developer mode does, it gives us a way to peek under the hood of what's going on inside of our web applications. Now, it used to be web applications, you'd go to a web page, you'd get a chunk of HTML, and that's all your web browser did was display the HTML. But that's not the case anymore. Web applications are a mixture of CSS and JavaScript and a whole series of bits that are constantly under the hood, making API calls back to other systems, grabbing information, doing refreshes, and lots of other stuff. And developer mode inside of the browsers is a way to kind of monitor all of those things. Look at the cookies, look at the JavaScript functions, look at the errors that are being generated. And so being comfortable and understanding a little bit about developer mode can be handy. Now you'll find developer mode in all the major browsers. I know Safari, Chrome, Firefox, they've all got it. And it's a way to kind of see what's going on. So let's actually see this in action and how I've used developer mode myself by looking at DNA Center APIs. So here now I've connected in, I've got my Google, I'm using Google Chrome, but again, the developer tools, you'll find it in most of the other areas. I'm gonna go ahead and log in to D, one of our Cisco DNA Center, always on sandboxes. <clears throat> All right, 
So I've logged into the page and we can see that there's uh, kind of I'm presented with a dashboard. I get information about the network devices, the wireless clients, all the pieces that are there. Um, now you might be wondering, how does the web page, where is all this information coming from? Well, under here, under the view menu and then developer, developer tools, let's see what's going on in the background. Now, developer tools comes here as a tab, and there's lots of areas we can go into. Elements lets you kind of look at the HTML and kind of hone in on what's there. Console relates to the JavaScript that's running in and any errors that might be coming through. Sources, you can actually see where all of the files that came from that were downloaded, whether they came from the appliance themselves or they came from other different locations. Where I spend a lot of time, though, is this network tab. The network tab is monitoring all of the different um, HTTP requests and, and um, inter interactions that this web application is doing to other locations that are there. And you can see as I'm just sitting here, as the page is refreshing itself, it's making calls that are there. And what I can see is all of these XHR, these are cross requests that are going in that are out there. And if I hover over some of these, you'll see these are actually API requests back to the Cisco DNA Center appliance itself to pull these statistics up. And so here I'm hovered over this one. This is the onboarding PNP count. Let's see if I can find one of these for some of these interesting bits that are out there. And so if I look at, let's see if I can find one of these network devices. Onboarding uh, right here. Okay, so uh, that one, I'm gonna go ahead and select it so I don't lose it. We can see over here in this network devices block, there are two unclaimed devices. Well, this API call here is actually how the page knows that is that it made a call to API v1 onboarding PNP device count with a state of unclaimed planned onboarding error. And then the output here, I can actually see the response was two to fill that piece of information in. And so I can see the underlying API calls that are being made. For example, if I jump into the inventory application from Cisco DNA Center, I'm gonna go ahead and clear out uh, everything that's been stored up and then say, go ahead and refresh. In here, now I can go ahead and see all of the different pieces and information that came through about these devices. So if I select one of these and preview the output, we can actually see all of the response details about these different devices that come through as we look at it. So the developer tools are, again, a way to kind of see what's going on under the hood. So if you're inside of a web application, whether it's Cisco DNA Center or whether it's uh, Cisco's uh, APIC controller or anything else that's out there, there's a decent chance that it's making API calls itself. You can use the developer tools to see what those APIs are and potentially even replicate those APIs in your own example code. Uh, Postman or the developer tools here in Chrome actually make that fairly easy as well. If I pick one of these API calls like this count API, right click on it, we can see I can actually copy this out as a curl request. That same curl utility we talked about in a previous tip, I can use the developer tools here to create a curl request for that exact bit of information, execute it myself, and get access to the information that the web application did as it goes through. So become comfortable with developer tools. Great way to continue your, uh, uh, to advance your network automation and net DevOps skill set. Whew. In summary, we went through a lot of stuff in the last 60 minutes in today's session. We spent a lot of time in Bash because I really think the comfort, getting comfortable with Bash is important as every network automation engineer that's out there. We'd spent some time on SSH, looking at certificates and SSH config files to become more comfortable leveraging SSH that are out there. And then we ended some with some really lightning uh, tips around application management, package management for your platforms, as well as plugins and IDEs that are out there. Now, if you're interested in the resources, everything is published already up on NetDevOps Live under the webinar resources for today's session. Uh, a couple of things that you'll find are links to Python. I always put that out there. Knowing where you can find some inf interesting information about network automation with Python from DevNet is a great one to have access to. And I also threw in the links for the Bash and Guest Shell information on NXOS and iOS XE if you want to dive deeper into those. If you're getting into development and you're still trying to figure out how to set up your laptop, I highly recommend the Laptop Setup Learning Labs up on DevNet. When I wrote these, the idea was to help everybody get the common set of development tools loaded on your workstation, whether you're a Mac, a Windows, or a Linux user. Same tools, full walkthroughs for all of those. A great kind of way to get yourself started as you go through. 
If you want to dive in and kind of, if you've been inspired by the tips that we had, take my code exchange challenge, put together a bash script or even better, a make file for some network automation project that's out there and add a make dev and a make clean to one of your automation examples. It's a great way to kind of level up your own work and working with your teams and then submit them up to code exchange so people can see them and take advantage of them as well. As always, we have a ton of great Net DevOps content all over the place up on DevNet, whether you're looking for videos or blogs or all of those pieces. So be sure to check out the resources that are there. And my contact information hasn't changed. Reach out to me on social media, HF Preston on Twitter. If you're on email or WebEx Teams, I'm HA or Ha Presto. And be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias at Cisco DevNet just about everywhere. With that, we are at the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me for laptop tips and tricks for the Net DevOps engineer. Be sure to come back next week for our episode then. Talk to you then. Bye.